Hi everybody, my name is Adam Su, and today I'll be discussing how I design an AI agent to solve the RPM problem. So the RPM project is a course long project for CS7637, Knowledge Based AI here at Georgia Tech. Without further ado, let's begin. Raven's Progressive Matrices, or RPM, is a nonverbal test typically used to measure the general human intelligence and abstract reasoning, and is regarded as one of the nonverbal estimate of fluid intelligence. Enough with the Wikipedia definition. What we are asked to do in this course project is to design an AI agent trying to solve these uh, series of RPM-inspired problems. First, let's go through some examples so we can see what the problems are like. In this first naive example, you can probably guess that the answer would be number two, the square. Since all three of the given images are square, it didn't leave much possibility for any other shape. In this next example, we see these uh, Pac-Man-like shape are facing towards the middle. And from top to bottom, we see the shapes go from completely filled to hollow. You probably say that the answer would be six, and that would be correct. In this example, we see that each image can potentially contain more than one shape. From left to right, we see that the middle filled diamond seemed to have disappeared. And then from top to bottom, we see the outer heart shape seem to become an octagon. That's why the octagon in number one seems like to be the most likely answer. Before we go ahead and jump into the three by three problems, let's first summarize what we learned from the two by two problems. Most of the time, whole frame matching is enough. Whole frame matching meaning applying some transformation to one of the images and we'll get exact match of one of the other. The type of transformation we're trying to apply here includes identical, which doesn't change anything, and flip vertically or horizontally, and rotation in multiples of 90 degrees. Now, of course, there are exceptions. If you go through all the basic uh, two by two problems, you'll find about a third of them doesn't have any sort of exact match after all the whole frame transformations. Some of the examples involves concept of separated shapes. Others might use ideas about the filled hollow properties of the shapes. Um, but the solution to these kinds of problems fits in a more general structure and is better illustrated with the three by three problems. Now let's see some three by three problems where the majority of the challenges came from. In this example, row wise, we see the number of diamonds are increasing in a diagonal direction and column wise is increasing in another direction. Now you'll be facing the choice between four and six, but the orientation of the diamonds in four seems to better align with that of the given images. In this example, we can understand it as sets of overlapping diamonds getting further apart horizontally in the row direction and uh, further away vertically in the column direction. So when they are separated horizontally and vertically, it will look like something in seven. In this example, going from the first row to second row, we see that every image uh, here shifted right by one unit. And then the triangle that we're supposed to go out of the grid, wrap around and appear at the beginning. You can imagine similar logic for a second row to a third row or from columns to columns. In this example, we see that from row to row, column to column, the concept of shape shifting one direction, while the concept of number of shapes shifting in other direction. The alternative way to think about this is that if we take the sum of number of shapes in one row, it should equal to the number for the other rows. And each row or column should contain the same set of unique shapes. In the last two examples, we see the kind of equation-like relationships happening within the rows and columns. If we use the pixel level logic operator or on A and B, we'll get the C as a result. If we use the pixel level or on A and D, we'll get the G as a result. So you can imagine the answer would be the result of C or F as much as G or H. This example is similar to the previous one, except the operator for the equations became the logical XOR. So what's the big takeaway? I categorize the methods for matching and measuring into three categories, delta, row column property sum, and equations like relationships. The first two categories of methods relies exclusively on the image level stats, which are calculated at the time the images are being read. I'll be going through each class of methods with you and explain the heuristics behind them. First of all, delta. Delta is the change between images. A lot of times when we're trying to describe what's happening from image A to B, essentially what we're trying to do is evaluating a distance or difference function in some latent space. 
For example, in the basic problem C01, the number of squares going from top to bottom is increasing, and the size of the bounding box of the outer square are also increasing. Horizontally, the sets of images stays exactly the same. We can understand it as the delta for number of shapes and the size of bounding box are at exactly zero. For the other examples, the delta mesh can come from any element of the calculatable stats of each image. It can be shape count, contour count, error ratio, filling ratio, average vertices, etc. Now is a good time to introduce the data structure that I use to make this all possible. At the time each image is being read in, the agent used connected component analysis to decompose each image into separated shapes and then use them to calculate some image level stats, which later being used by the delta methods and the row column property sum methods. As for where to find the comparable deltas or where to look for matches, the colored links in this figure shows just that. Take the purple links for example. The deltas from C minus A and F minus D will match increased shape counts, increased pixel count, same average vertice counts, etc. When an answer i is plugged into a slot and the delta of i minus g is calculated, the return delta might also contain some of the element that matches with the previous uh, purple links. Each matched properties will then be passed to the evaluation methods and increase the score of that particular answer that's plugged in. Here are some example value that I use for my evaluation methods. To make this a little more concrete, here the delta of C minus B and the delta of F minus E will match the minimum X of the bounding box stay the same, minimum Y, maximum Y of the bounding box stays the same, maximum X of the bounding box increased. So when we plug in number two into the answer slot, we see the delta element matched with the intersection of the previous two. And according to the evaluation method, each one of those match worth one point. So the answer currently have a score of four. And after all the links have been checked by the agent, the answer with the highest score will be returned. To make the delta actually comparable between the links, we need another delta discretization step. This happens when the delta object is created by taking the difference of two images. The value of each one of the delta elements will then be mapped into one of the three ranges, either increased, decreased, or same. The bound is not always at zero. It works fine for the exact value like contour count and shape count. But for pixel value like bounding box coordinate or centroid coordinate, it will be too sensitive to set it as exactly zero, as any tiny bit of misalignment issue will prevent the delta from matching. That's why I set the bound for any pixel type delta at plus minus two, and for the ratio type deltas, the bound is set to plus minus three percent. That was a lot to swallow for the delta methods. It actually contains most of the infrastructure talk. Now with the data structure defined previously, the second class of methods will seem much more straightforward. If we see delta methods as the methods for taking and comparing differences between images, then the row column property sum methods can be seen as the opposite, which is taking sum and comparing the sum across rows and columns. Take this earlier example. At the time, I was suggesting that the images from row to row, columns to column, can be viewed as shift one unit over and then wrap around. But you can also view it as the sum of some properties across one row would be equal to that of the other row. In this case, the number of average vertices of each image in one row equal to the other row, and it just happened that the columns are having the same situation. The sum of average vertices and total number of pixels in one row or column here serves as a proxy for a set of unique shapes, and it also avoids the needs for pixel level match for each image pair, which could cause huge burden if we go with the image shift in a grid concept. It's true for 3x3 three three problems, even more so if the problem size becomes large. It's also invariant to the multiple concept shift in different directions, and doesn't care about the pixel level mismatch. The links to check for the property sums are much simpler than the delta methods, since each comparable sum uh, we're summing over three images, we only need to check between the rows and between the columns. In practice, I only implemented a sum of average vertices, sum of total vertices, and sum of pixel count. 
some of pixel count might be compressing too much information and producing noisy results. That's why I had to adjust down the matching score in the evaluation methods. Here comes the last class of methods, equations. Essentially, what we are trying to do is treating each row or column as an equation. In this example, the operands can be the raw pixel with a slight position adjustment, or it can be the raw pixel count. And the corresponding operator that would take the place of the beta in the figure will be either the logical not or minus, respectively. In practice, I only implemented the raw pixel as operands and only three logical operators and or XOR. That was enough to cover more than 90% of that one problem set that focus exclusively on these problems. But when reading one of the reports of my peer, I realized there are more possibility for the operands, such as number of shapes, number of vertices, orientation angles, etc. Finally, let's talk about the performance. It takes five seconds to run the 130 examples on Grayscope. Scored an 84 out of 96 according to our grading scheme. It takes about 300 lines of code to implement. For reference, we have some people in my class that achieved 96 out of 96. Definitely have a lot of respect for them. But I'm also pretty happy with the structure of my agent that uses image level stats to achieve a satisfactory score with a fraction of the time cost. And that's the end. Thank you for listening.